I'm glad that all worked out the way it did. I think it was probably providential. I'm not a hocus pocus. Sister Kathy has never come to me in a dream and said, Tom, keep going. You're on the right path. I got none of that for you. All I know is keep plowing forward and hopefully something will happen. We got lucky as hell with the keepers. I, by then, I had my little website inside Baltimore. I would get three hits a week, maybe. Somebody who'd been Catholic and came across it by chance. And, hey, read your thing in inside Baltimore. Do you know that in the first six weeks after the keepers began, I received not three visitors a week, but 177,000 visitors. And many of them were just there to say, hey, I read that to work and I get a copy or stuff like that. But lots of others said, thanks for hanging in there. You and the keepers and all the other people who, including Erlinson, the original guys, they were bold and daring. Those guys had guts and I do not fault them in the least. They dared to start breaking that story, which was terrific. What happened when you asked Gemma to see if any of the Keo alumni would want to talk to you? I think she gave me a list of people who would be likely candidates from that era to remember what was going on and then would help me go ahead and start calling these people and looking for other kinds of information related to what they told We set up, uh, like, I would stay in the email loop with them so they wouldn't feel like they were only talking to a stranger. And I don't don't uh, remember this, but you had Lil. Do you remember Lil made an appointment to meet you? And you had Teresa. There were so many women that wanted to talk to you about what happened to them. It was like all hell broke loose. Thank you for that, Gemma. You just brought it back to me. Yeah, you know, I remember you came to Baltimore. You just brought me, you know how we are when we get older. I remember things five minutes too late, but Lil is Lil Hughes. You would send a warning email, look, I will stay in, on the interview with you if you want, or I will be available on email. We, uh, The first and last commandment we follow is, do no harm like a doctor. We will not injure anyone. People need to know that because as a journalist, I think that was one of your guidelines that you were going to be accessible to people, but you were not going to push people and you were not going to make them uncomfortable. And I think you did that the whole way through because nobody that you interviewed ever said they felt pressured or uncomfortable with you. And you did. You left it up to the survivor to say, okay, I can talk about it or I can't. So I want people to know what a good guy you were because not everybody operates that way. Thank you. And I'm well aware of your frequent announcements on this program that before you start listening, if you think you might have a triggering incident, here's your safety number to call, et cetera, et cetera. Absolutely. That was, I I could not live with myself if I, it's already hard to live with what I've seen these victims go through. Yeah. We don't have time for the list of people who killed themselves, drank themselves to death, drugged themselves to death, or simply lived imprisoning, dark, paranoid style lives of drunken possibility because of the way they were injured in these unspeakable manners. I just, it's a little thing. I think it's fair to say, to my knowledge, nobody really has communicated with me to say, Nugent, this is factually wrong. You do not know what you are saying here. It is an error. Mm-hmm. Nobody, including some of the very angry people, like certain priests I can name, therefore, I have to say, okay, Let's move on. I'm glad, certainly glad that's the case. This has been tough enough. I'm glad I'm not also dealing with horrible. Uh, you completely in error here. If you don't apologize by, on NBC News by Wednesday, the lawsuit starts at $20 million. There's none of that. It's not there. So as the keepers demonstrated, they sank their teeth into the basic narrative that you and I and several other people developed over a long period of time. I haven't seen anybody sue the keepers yet either, have you? No. The facts the facts are there, and they speak for themselves, and they speak in a disturbing way, as you know so well. And so I'm okay. I'm scared. Now, this is a real deal. I'll tell you something. I won't mention the specific family number, but one of Masco's family members, when I called to interview that person, 
and said, what about all this horrible stuff? It's pretty clear he did it. What, what's going on? This, this individual said, Mr. Nugent, I need to remind you that we still have ongoing live contacts with the IRA. Do you uh, get that? And I said, oh, pardon me while I'm choking here. When you mention IRA, what are you talking about? Irish Republican Army. The historic Is- force that fought for two centuries to eventually, eventually eject the, the British colonial empire from most of Ireland. They remain, of course, Northern Ireland remains a part of the UK. And there's a debate about that. Their gotcha. message was, if you're coming after Catholics, you're coming after us. Got it. And you're coming after Catholics. How did your online publication uh, Inside Baltimore develop? After the city paper story ran, I started to get calls. And by then, the, that technology was developing. I'm a, I can't change a spare tire. All I can do is type adjectives. That's what I've been telling people for years. I can't change a tire. I don't understand any of the electronics and computers, but I can type adjectives. It, it was a dark and stormy night. Gradually, Amy convinced me, hey, you ought to get an online presence that people can come to constantly because in all I've heard you're doing, Jim, you constantly underline the idea that we have to connect with each other right. and with other people who may know things. Of course, that's a great right. tool. It was certainly before the keepers, so it was probably around 2012. How many articles have you done on Inside Baltimore? Uh, there are probably 25 up there. I think, I think the heart of this, of what happened with Masco, and we can go there if you want later, is all about Ireland. And it's all about a uh, family in Ireland. What's your perspective on how Kathy's investigation, how that investigation was handled? That's quite a question, of course, as I'll try to give you a short answer. The basic line is this. The priest was mentally ill. He was also a vicious, angry man. I think there are reasons that account for that, psychological reasons, that are woven mysteriously and with great fascination I have looked into this. But the result was he felt he had the right to invade other people's privacy and even begin abusing them and raping them and all the rest that we, even the archdiocese has paid off victims and admitted that the accusations are, any reasonable person would say they are all true. So now you ask yourself, okay, I've got an out of control priest who is soon joined by a second priest, Father Magnus, also now is this. And now Magnus is raping these girls, and both of them are, we now know these to be factual accounts, also pimping them out, to use the street lingo, to, to, the, uh, to, to policemen and to politicians, including, I've heard from too many witnesses not to believe this, mm-hmm. some important politicians, not necessarily just important in Baltimore, but also important in Washington, D.C., at our dear old nation's capital. Amen. So this sick circus is beginning to unfold. He's taking, sending girls up to that Holiday Inn on week 40, and the cops are coming in and having their way with them, and maybe mm-hmm. a couple of city councilmen, and maybe even a senator, maybe even a few former Baltimore mayors. Good heavens. Then something changes. And the, what is the something? This is my understanding right now. Dear old Father Maskell decides he wants more academic credentials. He goes over to Johns Hopkins School of Psychiatry and takes takes a one-year course in what they call educational psychology. What does he find at Hopkins? When he goes over to Hopkins, remember, he is a certified 100% Roman collar wearing and really energetic, hard-nosed Catholic priest. And he goes over and he says, I want to know more. I teach a course on psychology at Keo. He's giving classes at Keo in which he says, I am real smart. Not only that, I'm earning a degree in educational psychology and it ain't at the local Catonsville Community College. I'm over there in that big, hard-hitting, one of the world's great healing centers of our time. John Hopkins University, that's my educational certificate thing. It amounted to going over there once a week for a two-hour class so they could earn a little extra income, in my opinion. I have a master's degree in the humanities, 
from Johns Hopkins myself. So I feel entitled to claim that I have some insight about how they actually do business over there. And I will tell you something in a moment, I think, that might shock you considerably. At any rate, where are we? Maskell is getting his degree and telling the girls that he understands how this kid Marnie was sexually abused and they got to watch this film with him. And then if any of them feel like they were abused at home by an uncle or a cousin or, God help us, even a father, they need to come to him. And like John Connery, the star psychiatrist in Marnie, he will help them figure out their terrible scars and their injury from this problem and make them whole and healthy again. Except something is going on at Hopkins during this too. Hopkins is one of Hopkins is at the during this period is one of the forty four named American universities and colleges that are participating in illegal mind control experiments. And I'll get you the documentation in a minute. It, you can get it on Wikipedia. If you just follow the link nowadays, it's so common. And it says, the techniques they used were often drugs, especially LSD, but they also frequently used hypnotism. How many uh-huh. guys had you two interviewed women who described TikTok? He's swinging the watch back and forth. Yep, he does, all, he does, all right. And soon he doesn't even need the watch. All he's got to do is say the word TikTok, and you're into the spell, the voodoo. Oh, my God. Okay, but in the language that is in the 500, 700 pages of the postscript, there are 700 pages of testimony in the 1977 and the follow-up in 79 congressional testimony before the Church Frank Church of Idaho Committee The detail right down to the smallest names, addresses, and phone numbers where this stuff was occurring and what they were creating these cutouts of the term in that by now, these secret phony corporations, they would create a cutout. A cutout is five guys who are connected but removed one step from our intelligence community. Create Acme Research Company, right? Acme Research Company goes to Hopkins. We'd like you to do a study of the kind they did in San Francisco frequently. We want to set up, say, a house of prostitution. But when the guy, when the sailors off the ships come in to do their thing in the house of prostitution, we want you to train the women to give them LSD unwittingly. When they're totally confused and so on. And you see where this goes. In that language, spoken and now recorded right there for all of your listeners to read, if they dig a little. Right online, it says, the tools that were often used in the mind control experiments without informing the subjects often, unwittingly, included drugs, hypnotism, and targeted sexual abuse. That abuse was used. Now we have here, this old-fashioned parlance sounds almost nostalgic, a sex ring, a sex ring. In which girls are being fed to cops and politicians. But at the heart of it is this guy. Where is he? He's at Hopkins, where several of the professors of that day are also in the record books as running these programs that are using some of the time targeted sexual abuse to so dissociate the mind of victims that they no longer. One woman that I know about. And I'm convinced this is accurate. I had to have a tattoo on her arm so that when she heard the triggering number or phrase and lost her ability to know who she was, she would look at her arm to find her address and her phone number. Okay, there were scenarios of this kind. There were women, and I did, you've done such great lengthy work, I couldn't listen to everything. But I listened very carefully to your interview. May I use her first name? In which the woman described being taken to Dr. Richter and uh, Lynn. drugs Lynn. and so on. Yeah, Lynn. Lynn. Man, Lynn's, uh, I listened to all of it, and it meshed with everything I have ever heard. I have got witnesses who were in rooms where abuse victims were managed by a uniformed nurse who uh-huh. gave them a hypodermic injection, and then electroshock and other kinds of monitoring devices were applied to them. Or they were led into scenarios 
where they would be deceived into thinking that if they pulled the trigger, they would kill someone. Or exactly. they, and you're right. And there's far too much of that. So when you say, oh, my God, are we in outer space here? Uh, that would be your first thought if you don't know about it. But if you look, it takes a while and it's grueling. Go page by page, line by line. There is no question but that the church committee and other committees and investigative papers, especially the New York Times, have dug in over enough time to show that something was occurring. And this is where I do think I have something new that might be of interest as a theory. Anyway, in 1991, every we're all of us, including me, are lopping around and hysterical with excitement. Oh my God! We've learned that. Why? What is this? Why their mask buried all this stuff in the ground at Holy Cross Cemetery in 91? And the groundskeeper comes forward. The groundskeeper's in the Baltimore Sun. He says, God damn, I don't know what was going on with that. But I could have buried the entire front loader into that huge hole that Father Masco had made there. And it was in there. I don't know. There's all these records and stuff. Look like fingers, psychology tests and histories. And we did this with this person. And then she did that. And here's how it ended. And here's what the scores are on her. Electroshock 901 form and all this stuff. One of the things that took me years to slowly begin to realize was this. I know the standard cartoon version of sex abuses, especially pedophiles, is they love to have trophies and they love to have, if they got a pair of underwear from somebody or a photo of a naked woman or something, they want that because you're crazy. Sorry. Here's why he put the stuff in the ground. He's part of this ongoing, maybe many years, crazy, half out of control, illegal intelligence apparatus. And he's, but he's running all his own games around that. Anybody who's with him for five minutes knows he's crazy as a bed bug and vicious, to say the least. But they, they, at least it never gets to the point where somebody up way high in the organization says, Take it out, take him out and make it look like a car wreck. Let him go. Maybe they're afraid he's put triggering stuff somewhere and he's maybe told them, if I have a car wreck and you think it's not because I was drunk, but maybe it's or a heart attack, here's the map. And the map will take you to Holy Cross Cemetery. And you start at the oak tree and you draw a dotted line 12 feet. He needed to get all of the data and all of the files that it was involved in whatever form of that crap he was doing, he needed to get it back if he had to. I actually heard another priest who was his defender say, what are you blaming there? Come on. He didn't want to pollute. That's a lot of paper. I mean, he heard this yeah. We think there's a lot more buried in Holy Cross because people's <laughs> graves were moved, people's families, their parents weren't where they were supposed to be. So we totally agree with you, and we disagree that it was ruined in a flood. I think whoever removed it permanently and destroyed it that very day. But of course, that's only my my opinion. I well, want to add to what you're saying. Well, let me, uh, Jim, let me, let, Jim, let me just jump in because I have an enormous, I think. An enormously important fact to support right. what you were just saying here. Here it is. Uh -huh. you, you, I think you probably know this, but I'm sure many listeners don't. And it, it's huge. In 1963, an army sergeant jumped out of a 20th story window and killed himself on the, because it's the LSD he was taking that he didn't know he was uh -huh. taking. There's a terrible scandal about all of this began to break. Richard Helms, then the CIA director, gave a huge press conference and said, I have destroyed 300,000 pages of several ongoing projects, not just MK Ultra, Project Artichoke was the name of them. What do you do with the reality here? Do you say to yourself, it's a shame that kids have to go without food and shoes. It's a shame that girls at a Catholic high school had to be tortured and driven insane and killed at times. It was part of a Cold War dynamic. And the important thing was that the world not... The important thing first was that Hitler not win, and he didn't. And then it was real important that Stalin not win, and he didn't. 
Can you tell us who killed Sister Kathy? Sister Kathy, this is my best. This is my best. Yes. Your best I guess. I, yeah. I am I scale of one to ten. I'm on a I'm on a nine, maybe an eight point five. I'll give it a nine. I'm nine on a ten. It was a Baltimore city policeman, and the weapon was a famous Baltimore police tool, the Espen Toon. Her head wounds in the autopsy, Sister Kathy. Right. Match match what many cops have said in the past was the kill weapon on Sister Kathy, a famous kind of billy club from back in the H.L. Mencken era, the wonderful Mencken, a bit of nostalgia for you. In Baltimore, they had a famous saying that if you had one too many beers at O'Malley's and you got rowdy, you might get hit in the head with an Espen tune. E-S-P-A-N-T-O-N. It's a wooden club with a funky little curve in it it's ideal for making sure that if a cop hits you with that, <laughs> you'll know it. A and very wounds, interesting observation. The wounds, the wounds that are caused by an espantoon reportedly match the wounds in the nun's skull. I also have independent information. Maskell had a crew of really nasty guys that he, janitors, we call them. If Michael right. got into a problem, he called on a janitor. People allegedly, and I underline that adverb, allegedly like Edgar Davidson, mm -hmm. like allegedly like Schmidt, Smitty. Right. Uh, and he's on the laundry list. Yeah, the laundry list of names. And when Maskell got into trouble, he called for the janitors. Mm -hmm. The janitors, the janitors agreed to do the janitor work. Remember, nobody doubts anymore that Maskell was in the nun's apartment the night before she vanished and died. Nobody denies anymore, it's fat, cold, that Maskell was at Keogh High School waving a weapon and threatening a couple of kids who knew about some of this, that if they mouthed mm -hmm. off about all of it, they would suffer. Okay, that same night that he's in the school, what happens? The call goes out, we need janitors. The nun has by now, be, I have some sources, I don't know where you are, that have said the nun had outright told them if he doesn't leave Keo, ASAP, go elsewhere and leave these kids alone, I'm going to the cops or mm -hmm. the FBI or all of the above. Okay. So the call goes out. We need janitors. I think the other priests. This is an opinion. I want to underline allegedly. I do not know factually, but I would be willing to place a wager on it if someone right. asked me the wager. The call, the call went out to the priest's boyfriend, Poop, and his pal, Pete McKeon. Brother Pete McKeon. The call went out, help me, help me. Something is dreadfully wrong here. My God, the nun didn't come home from her shopping trip with the biscuits and the bread and the wedding gift, et cetera, et cetera. What could it possibly mean? But my, I'm almost, I'm nine. I'm nine out of 10. Those guys don't have, and here I, may I use the Spanish term cojones. They don't have the balls to go in there, cold-blooded, cash on the barrel head and kill somebody. But they've got the smarts. They're wily serpents, some of these dudes. They got the smarts to call the people who do have that kind of balls. Mm -hmm. kind of guy you call, he's the sergeant or the lieutenant on the police force who for some time has been enjoying all of this by abusing mm -hmm. girls in the state house and right. them out at the Holiday Inn and so on. And you know what? When he gets over there and some car pulls in next to Sister Kathy's car and he's talking, you're not hearing, oh, blessed be our Lord Jesus. Oh, please, I must tell you, you're hearing, get in the car. We've heard, I've talked to the wife of a deceased officer who was quite violent. He has been identified, his picture has been identified by a number of the women who were at Keo. And I'm not at liberty to say who he is, but he actually had certain kind of billy clubs made that were more like torture instruments. So it's but, interesting what you're saying fits into the picture that is forming in my head as well. 
For the last question, yeah. I'd like to ask you really quick, what is in your attic? I, thank you. There's a lot up there. There are several stories I've worked over the years, some only for a short time. They're up there. Stories of whistleblowers like that NSA guy I told you who, who blurted that you're, yeah, you're, you're illegally monitoring phone conversations. Or the FBI guy who came, first came forward and said, you are doctoring lab results in the national FBI lab in order to get convictions, and it is absolutely criminal. But the biggest story of all that's up in the attic, I want to mention the name, Dr. Jim Murtaugh, M-U-R-P-A-G-A. Murtaugh is a University of Michigan medical school graduate. 20 years ago, he began informing the FBI in Atlanta, Georgia, that he was seeing a pattern that some of the federally financed research projects, the kickbacks were take, being taken out of that money, manipulated through the highest levels of Georgia government. He began meeting with FBI agents. They debriefed him, and on their instruction, he collected all kinds of financial data to support this. In the middle of it, he was poisoned with arsenic, nearly died. Ultimately, the Senate majority leader and the most powerful, except for the governor, figure in the state of Georgia went to prison on 67 felony counts. And they were able to put a halt to this absolute research fraud that was taking place. He slowly builds a national coalition of whistleblowers with everybody is free. All you have to do is Google his name and the stuff will start popping up and the story of what happened in Georgia.